Welcome to Collaborative Podcast. I'm your host, Spencer Krauss. Our guest today is Morgan Redfield, coming in for the second time. Morgan is an embedded and electrical engineer. Uh, Morgan, welcome to the pod. Thanks. It's, ha- it's good to be here. Good to have you again, buddy. Yeah, we've hung out a whole bunch of times since the last one of these we recorded, but this is our first time doing this again. Yeah. Yeah, it was a fun time last time, though. Yeah, I really enjoyed having you on. It's a good um, conversation. Yeah. So, yeah, also, also fun to... Um, kind of figure out what you can and can't talk about in these things. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, if you, if you get too close to the, the real good stuff, I'll be sure to redirect. Perfect. <laughs> so um, you were talking about like a project you want to do for your kids lately. That seemed like a good place to start where there's nothing. Yeah. Uh, so I, I think my kids are both three. I have, I have three-year-old twins and I'll say um, the pandemic, I've been working from home a lot. They like to run in and ask what I'm doing and, uh, the only thing they know about robots is that they're really good at dancing from that Boston Dynamics video a while ago. I remember that one. Um, so they've been asking to like play with my work stuff for a long time. I finally decided like, all right, I'm going to make them a robot. Um, <laughs> I'm probably going to make them like a, a toy RC car or something like that. Um, I think I was telling you earlier, there's a project called Donkey Car, which is yeah. you, you like take an RC car, just not the shelf RC car, and you like slap a Raspberry Pi and a camera on it, and um, then it's like self-driving. That's um, really cool. You can like drive it around, record it driving around your house, train a neural net on all the images that it takes, and then you, it'll like drive around your house on its own. Do you need like a secondary sensor source, like a son- uh, not sonar, like an IMU or like encoders to do like a proper slam? No, well, for, to do a proper slam, you you might, um, you can do vision only slam, but oh, I didn't know uh, that. Okay, that's interesting. Yeah, it's not nearly as accurate though. You end up doing like, especially if you only have one camera, like monocular um, uh, ego motion uh, localization. Yeah. Where you say like, here's a frame, here's another frame, calculate the like um, displacement of the. Camera so you find frames. like. I want to say anchor points, but... Anchor points is, like, exactly right. Okay, cool. Yeah, or key points or, like, feature points. Yeah, makes sense. Um, And then you, like, uh, can just do some moderately complex geometry and and figure out, like, how the camera moved between the frames. So I think you would need, like, a fast frame rate or a slow car to make that work. Yeah, that's that's true. Um, The donkey car doesn't do any of that. Uh, Like, it actually doesn't do slam. Um, It's all just pure, like image to like uh, motor angle oh, cool. um, or, or steering angle um, so it's, so it's like, like tele-op it's not tele-op it's oh, like there, there's a neural net it's looking at the image the image comes in goes into the neural net and steering commands go out um, oh, cool. so so like the way this whole thing works is like you, first you drive it around your house manually and you record the whole thing so you've got the images and you've got your steering commands from you like actually driving it with a remote control Okay. And you train your neural net on that source data, and I'm sure you want to do that like as much as you can, and just get a bunch of different yeah, rounds. Yeah, yeah, and... like twenty, a hundred, two hundred, however many rounds you go, like yeah. as many as you need. Always the same route, so it's actually kind of tedious and boring. But then at the end of it, you, you train your I'm neural sure net. I'm sure kids would be fine with that. Though. <laughs> <laughs> I, I will probably wait until they're gone, and then like train it, and then hand it to them, and like they can turn it on, and it'll drive around for them. Um, <laughs> And, you know, you can, like, put it into remote control mode, and then they can drive it. So so that's kind of the project for um, – I told them that I would give them a robot in the summer. So that's, nice. that's like, the next big project. So you got a pretty aggressive timeline coming up. I've already got the car. I've already got the Raspberry Pi. Oh, not like, they're fine. I was telling you I have, like, 30 Raspberry Pis in my closet. So <laughs> just need to, to pick one and put it all together. So. Nice. Yeah, I was saying, like, the eBay market for the fours is up. It's really interesting because – they're like twice what I paid for them last time I bought one. I haven't actually looked into the fours. Are they a, a big jump from the previous versions? In terms, of I, I run a three and I run a four, um, and they're not. I, I think I don't know. I I'd, I'd be lying if I said I remember the hardware specs. To be honest. Okay. Um, what I will say, one cool thing they did on the four that seems a little silly to me, but is kind of interesting and neat, is there's dual mini HDMI outputs mm-hmm. or micro HDMI outputs. I think. And so that's kind of neat that they just gave it dual monitors on like a little single board. You know? Yeah. Almost everything I do is so embedded that like I would never even connect. Well, yeah, well, me but, too. So that's why it's, it's yeah. like a little silly. Like you might do it just to program it. But Yeah. Like I uh, did a lot of stuff with the Pi Zero specifically because it has like 
it has it has no vision vision up. Like you don't need it. That's awesome. I'm sure it costs way less for that reason too. Yeah, for sure. Um, it's still like pretty power hungry and, and pretty big though. Um, actually, for a long time, I was doing a lot of work with the Intel Edison and still would be if they hadn't canceled it. Like, is that like the NUC or like? Uh, the Edison is just like this tiny single board computer specifically meant for embedded or like well, robotics that's cool. applications. I hadn't, I hadn't messed with that before. Yeah, it's like kind of like a Raspberry Pi. There's no GUI at all though. It like doesn't support any kind of um, that's pretty uh, vision awesome. interface. And it's very, very low power. So that's cool. Um, while they were selling it, was is it running like, Linux or just like bare yeah, metal? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, you would put Yocto on it, some version of Yocto. Um, yeah. And uh, yeah, it was phenomenal because it was like a quarter of the size of even a Pi Zero. That's awesome. Um, so, but of course, Intel being Intel canceled it. Like yeah, they got rid of it. Didn't they? I heard they canceled the Real Sense as well. But then yeah. somebody was telling me it was just the five fifteen lidar camera. Hmm. I also heard they canceled it, but I don't. I don't watch the real sense too closely, so yeah, I don't, I don't know the details. I don't love that it's like reliant on USB. Like that was probably the biggest bottleneck for me mm, when I yeah. was messing with those on yeah. projects. It's uh, not even USB three, probably. So like, I think it is I, USB three. It is. Okay. I, I so think that, it is. That's high enough bandwidth that you could do some pretty well, cool stuff with it. Yeah, but like when you're trying, to, I, I had. A project where I wanted seven of them on one platform, <laughs> okay, and like the, the Xavier NX, which was what I was using, got bogged down after four. Yeah. Um, but you would hope like that ASIC you could offload, and I'm sure if we tweaked it enough, we could have figured it out. But mm -hmm. just I don't know, it wasn't like an important project. Yeah. It was like a fun project. I feel like seven high frame rate cameras. You're gonna need some like dedicated hardware to handle that, regardless of what interface you're using. What would you recommend? That's a good question. Um, I mean, the only things that I've really done with high frame rate cameras are like just off the shelf USB or MIPI. And you probably don't want MIPI because uh, that's like a really annoying interface to deal with. Yeah, although off the shelf USB has an issue with the real sense. And I'd, I'd seen this on our application and then also uh, at the Field Robotics Center, which is that it had a tendency to crash, like the way the real sense drivers handled, like, a, if you had like bottlenecking on the bus or you had like a missed frame or wh whatever, it would just lose communication with the camera. And then apparently like, and I didn't have the service call personally, but another engineer related to me, like Intel would tell you to get smart and like put relays on the power to the cameras to power cycle them when okay. you get that. Okay. Which is a little silly. Um, like I feel like if they had done it like over ethernet or something, you know, they could have probably delivered a more robust system, but I don't know how much it would have cost to do that or if you lose frame rate or... Yeah, and I don't know what the failure mode would have been, right? Like, depending on what the failure mode was, even with Ethernet, you might have had to power cycle it. Like yeah, that, you might be right. That seems like a like a weird solution. Like, there, there must be something weird going on internally to the to the real sense where you would have to power cycle it. Like, um, just it being USB doesn't explain that to me. That's interesting. And you might be right. I mean, I mean a I bunch of robotics companies were using side. those for, yeah. like, for a while it was on, like, Vecna's website. It was, like, a video of a real, or no, maybe it was Seagrid, one of those two. Mm. But there was just a video of, like, a real sense, like, going up to something. Yeah. So. I will say, like, from a, like, uh, like, failure-aware perspective or, like, a, a fault-tolerant um, design perspective, it makes sense to me that you would want to be able to reboot a system. But a lot of times you just do that through whatever your control interface is, right? You don't necessarily need to um, have a switch on the power. So. Yeah. And there might be a way to do that too. I, you know, never really got that far. I just know that that's like another group solution to dealing with it was gotcha. having relays or SSRs, power cycle, USB. Yeah. I mean, you do what you've got to do, but yeah. depending on what their boot time is, you're going to lose a lot of frames there. Yeah. Yeah. I would think so. I worked uh, I worked for a while on a system that um, had a boot time of like over a minute <laughs> um, and this was like on a, a mission critical camera that had to like provide data to this um, localization system that oh, was working brutal. On. And, uh, yeah it, it, it was harsh it was basically like if it lost power during the uh, like most important part of the mission they were screwed um, <laughs> so how'd you get around that? I mean, we just, like, 
did everything we could to make it as robust as possible so it would never have to be rebooted so that it would never have to like it would never run into any edge cases like a bicore power supply with like local filtering and yeah yeah um, a lot of uh, a lot of power supply filtering but then also a lot of work in software um, to like handle every edge case you can think of that that's might, pretty cool that might come up and you know we had um, like access to all the software it was running so we could do that um, whereas like with a real sense camera or something like in that case you just have whatever's on there so you can't necessarily go in and, and write all of the um, failure handling that makes that sense I'm surprised you couldn't get the boot time down if you had that level of access, but there must have been like some hardcore component that was juicing up or something. Yeah, I think um, in this case, uh, like this was kind of old hardware that we had to support. So okay, um, that makes sense. We, we weren't using like um, cutting edge, uh, cutting edge CPU or anything like. That's that. a good point. I mean, and so like up until recently, I mean, the kind of times you get on like booting and you know, cycle. I mean, none of that was feasible. Yeah. Although it seems like in the last three years we haven't really had major advances as far as I know because everyone's just been trying to keep up with supply chain. Yeah, I don't know. Um, I guess I haven't been keeping track of like where the CPU world is going in the past few years. Yeah. But, like, and I might have missed something because I, I don't really follow it that closely either. It just it seems like seems like it's been pretty good. In and, terms like, of consumer grade hardware, it seems like they've kind of reached a level where performance almost doesn't matter. Um, like, you know, grandma's gonna be running a web browser maybe. But yeah. She doesn't need the, the most powerful processor. When so I was... like all the hardware, all the real amazing hardware development goes into the um, stuff for training neural nets, like yeah. all the TPUs. And... When I was thinking of more like the NVIDIA uh, Xavier line, oh, yeah, I, don't, yeah. I don't think they've had a new release on that line for like three years, right? I mean, mm -hmm. unless I'm missing something, in which case I might know about I wouldn't know, but. I thought the AGX was like the top of the line and like people have just been having trouble getting those, trying to get them, but. Yeah, I mean. I, I don't know, they might have something new that's come out or. The supply chain problem is is a real problem. Like yeah. that's, that's impacting everybody for sure. Yeah, for sure. I mean, the iPhone 13 apparently was like very similar to the iPhone 12. Mm -hmm. I'm an Android man, so I nice. can't, can't speak to that. Don't like the walled garden of the iPhone. I have an iPhone 12. Um, I also don't like that they don't give you access to like those features I miss from my Android. Mm -hmm. um, I have I have a Motorola like phone at home, and then I have my iPhone just in case I want to do an Android thing. Oh yeah. Um, but the reason I got the iPhone was that I had a Pixel 4a that I bought, and my first day running it, I was in a meeting with a high value prospect trying to sell them a contract. Hey, excuse me. Salud. <laughs> Thanks. That's an embarrassing sound. But um, anyway, so I um, I was trying to sell a contract, and my phone just overheated in the middle of the meeting. Um, and uh, it was a Pixel 4a, and I sort of tried to get back on the call, but everyone had left, and the other sales engineer I had on the call didn't have the training to know to like oh, no. set the correct follow-ups. Yeah, so I might have lost an opportunity. So you know that was annoying. Yeah. That's killer. Yeah, it was brutal. And then I went to do something else, and then I got the phone to power back up in my pocket, you know, and it was all good. And then when I left this other event, I pulled it out, and the screen was cracked down the center. Oh, no. And so I... Man, you have very bad luck, apparently. With phones, especially, yeah. yeah. No, my, my dad was coming, and he's like, you have really bad luck with phones. Like, what are you doing to ruin these things? Yeah. I, I had a Pixel 2 for four years, maybe. It's almost embarrassing to say that I haven't been keeping up with the cutting edge, but like, That's yeah, about Whatever. four or five years I had a Pixel I have a 2. bunch of Pixel 2s and a Tupperware at home and Pixel yeah. 3s. They were fantastic phones, and I just upgraded to a, a Pixel 5. Actually, um, I think I have like a bunch of Pixel 2s with cracked screens I got just for like dicking around with on robots okay. projects. Nice. Yeah. yeah. Although it kind of sucks because I got them, and then I realized there's like some level of control that you can't get or it was like useless for what I want it for. Interesting. I'm curious, what were you trying to use it for? It's like, like a brain for a robot. Okay. Okay. And like, what was the problem? What could you do? Um, I think it was just like an issue with like access to like the USB port in a certain way. Where oh, interesting. Okay. Like the, the most recent firmware like locked you out from something that you needed to be able to use. Like, cause I wanted like a cheap G GPS and IMU and you know, just all the, you know, yeah. compute and all that I mean, stuff. 
phones are kind of amazing compute platforms and sensor platforms. So like yeah, and I'd seen it done. I mean, on robots that were like low budget, and it was kind of a cool thing to mess around with. But yeah, I knew a guy who um, he was doing a bunch of Bluetooth proto prototyping for like a, a Bluetooth localization system. That's and cool. The, the way that he implemented it was he got. Uh, 500 phones, and he just put a grid of 500 phones in the ceiling of this warehouse. That's awesome. And each of them had Bluetooth and was networked, so he could just like figure out um, where like whatever Bluetooth device he was trying to track was phones. by localizing from each of the phones. Were they identical, or were they? Yeah. yeah they were. Okay. Because yeah, I feel like a lot of people that are on like a, a budget will like just have like. This guy was not on a budget. Okay. He was like, "What's the fastest way that I can do this thing?" That's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> That's sweet. Yeah, no, that sounds like a good way to do it. I remember when I was, um, well, I probably shouldn't say. <laughs> but, <laughs> uh, you, um, have, you have the secret interesting stuff. Yeah, on that one. It's like not that juicy, but like the um, company it's about is really litigious, so I figure it's just... Yeah, better, better to avoid. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Redirect. For sure. So like the reason that Pixel 4a failed, apparently like there's like Lewis Rossman videos on it, there was like a flex circuit that was bent over like at like a 180 degree angle okay and it would i don't know if it would short against the chassis or like some piece of foil in there but i think what oh. had happened is the battery shorted from the inside it puffed up and then cracked out the screen oh man but when i contacted google support they said to send them pictures of it and i sent this whole arrogant like you know i'm a mechatronics engineer and i'm pretty confident <laughs> this is exactly what happened Okay. You know, just like, sure, they would, you know, just replace my phone. And they were like, oh, there's a physical crack. That means it's your fault, you know. And oh, so wow. I bought a phone that was five times expensive just to kind of cut off my nose to spite my face. Yeah, that's that's funny. <laughs> Man, so that's the total opposite of my experience with uh, Amazon. So, like, I got my kids a, a Kindle Fire tablet. Like, they have these um, actually pretty, pretty nice tablets for kids that yeah. have, like, super ruggedized cases on them and everything and um of course my kids like throw it around drop it like it's totally fine for almost a year <laughs> and it's it only breaks because they're like yanking on the usb cable <laughs> and, uh, while it's plugged in and charging yeah um and i'm like i'm an electrical engineer i know how to do this i'll to, like take it apart and um and and just fix it so i like take the whole i take the whole tablet apart i like find the usb jack and Amazon has designed this USB jack to be like proof against anything except a three-year-old, basically. <laughs> like definitely proof against me. <laughs> it has uh, several like um, metal shields on it that are just locking it in place. That That's are cool. both soldered and screwed in place onto the onto the board. That's awesome. Um, on a Kindle Fire. Yeah. So it's it's like. Uh, that sounds way overbuilt. That's like a high rel. I mean, it it makes total sense for them, and and here's why. I was like, this this part, like, I, I can't replace this part. I can't source this part to replace it if I could take it apart. Um, and it's like Amazon proprietary. Yeah, exactly. So I boxed the whole thing back up, put the enclosure back together, and I sent it to Amazon, and they just sent me a new one. Dude, they, they will do that. Like, I've called them up and been like, it's totally my fault. This is how I broke the thing. Like, oh, yeah, yeah no problem. Yeah. I, I bought another Kindle the next day. I was like, all right, all right. You well, dude, me. yeah, I, I give Jeff Bezos so much money. I, I was looking at my Amazon purchases in, like, 2022. Or, no, 2021. I think I bought between, like, me and SKA, like, that's embarrassing, like, 671 items on, or, yeah, orders right. on Amazon. All right, yeah. Which means, like, there's at least, like, 1,000, 1,500 items. Yes. <laughs> Man, but yeah. that's that's like the, that's like the thing is like they have to make the USB jack that that beefy that supported specifically because they just like they have that good customer service that will just replace it. Yeah, like, I opened this thing up, totally would avoid avoided the warranty with anybody else. So like, oh, yeah, I'll replace it. Okay. This is why you have all the money in the world. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, me too. Like, I mean, I'll have. I think only once out of like. I mean, I've returned hundreds of things to Amazon, um, like, and many of them were my fault, and like, only once did they ever be like, no. <laughs> like, that's... 
Yeah. I bought like a water heater um, to upgrade something at my place. Water heater. It was like it was like an auxiliary I'm, water tank. I'm imagining like, like one of those cylinders that's like eight feet high and like three feet around. Yeah, except I got a mini thirteen gallon one. Okay. Um, for something. I have no idea you can even buy something like that. Yeah, it's kind of Amazon will sell it to you. It's like three hundred dollars. It was like a Bosch unit. It was okay. pretty pretty sweet. Okay. And so I. Um, I live in a crappy apartment, and my shower will, like, get really hot and really cold. So in my head, I was like, if I just install an auxiliary water heater, uh, I can probably fix this issue and, like, add basically, like, a low-pass filter. Interesting. Okay. My latest way to fix it. <laughs> Dude, this, this, I just, I love, like, living inexpensively, but, like, my, which, which is why I bought 700 packages on Amazon <laughs> this year. <laughs> It's like, I, I, I'm not, I'm, I'm actually, I, I will live pretty extravagantly in some ways, but then, like, I just don't care to spend money on where I live, I guess, is probably what okay. I actually you got your priorities. Yeah, we'll exactly. Yeah. I've got an Amazon addiction, and um, because of that, I live in a cardboard box to support my crack <laughs> habit with Amazon. But, <laughs> but it's a nice cardboard box. It's got a good water heater. Yeah, yeah exactly. Well, I actually, I, I wanted to return it, because I, I, you know, it was just too much of a pain in the ass to install. And now I've got a different, I bought like all these like shark bite fittings and like a thermostatic mixer, which is um, like meant to, it's probably like a bimetal thing if I had to guess, because there's like no power going to it. But I think it's meant to hold a temperature. So I'm like, my next thing I'm going to do is I'm just going to take a, I'm going to replumb the shower to use a thermostatic mixer. Okay. So it's three knobs. It's, this is the crappiest part. So it's got like one knob in the middle that switches from like the faucet to the shower head. It's got one that's hot water, and then it's got one that's cold water. And then if somebody flushes their toilet, like, it just gets immediately hot and scalds you. Sure, sure. And then if, like... Like anybody else in the apartment complex. Right? Exactly, yeah. right? And it's, it's like, a decent amount of folks. Like, it's, I think it's, like, an eight-unit building. So they shower at midnight when everybody else is asleep. Yeah, or, like, it, it turns out there's not a whole lot of early risers in that building. So if you're showering at, like, 6.30, 7 a.m., like, you're fine. You know, it's, uh, All right. You learn too much about your neighbors that way. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's kind of hilarious. And so, like, anyway, um, I don't know. Hopefully this thing will, I don't know how reactive it is or if it's, like, quick enough to keep up with that level of fluctuation, but I'm hoping. What I'm planning on doing is taking out the hot or the cold water tap uh, knob, leaving the hot water knob in, but changing it into a throttle and then putting this thermostatic mixer where the cold water tap was. And then I am going to take a, um, I, bought, I, bought, <laughs> I bought like a $200 power tool from Milwaukee that's like just for like getting around a copper pipe and cutting it. Oh, cool. Yeah, I, I just, just I, wanted, I wanted a toy. I, I mean, to be honest, like tools like that that are special purpose, like those are so fun. Yeah, so and, and they definitely come in. Like, I have an SDS drill from Makita that's pretty sweet. Nice. And like, I, I mounted security cameras all over the exterior of my building. And, okay. And I don't know. I don't think this is unique to me because, like, I found out my brother and his wife recently are, like, putting a French drain into a rented house in Austin, Texas. <laughs> I'm like, you guys are renting. Right. What the hell are you doing? Like, well, we can't buy in this market. We want to fix up a house. I'm like, all right. <laughs> you do you. I mean, I mean, if you're going to be renting from the same place for a while, you might as well enjoy it, right? Upgrade it, yeah. yeah. So I put in these puck lights, like, in, in all the, uh, like, I have a coat closet, and I have a closet I get dressed in. And I told you about the weather station I bought for the closet. Oh, yeah. Which is, um, like, a little LCD that, like, hooks up to map, or weather underground, like, some antiquated okay. weather okay. service provider. And then, I'm sure, like, Google just wouldn't give them the API access they needed. And, mm -hmm. um... It has like a wind speed detector and nice, nice. yeah, like humidity and temperature and goes on your roof. And so I'll probably set that up. I've got like a Yagi antenna that points at an AT and T cell tower that repeats <laughs> cell signal okay, in my sweet, place. Sweet. I've made what so many modifications. Um, just some Chinese nonsense. It's, okay, okay. I think the company that makes it's called Ming Cell. Interesting. I did a bunch of work with a uh, um, with the USRP once, um, like. Doing cell tower emulation. USRP. Um, yeah, this is like the universal software radio peripheral. Um, if you haven't heard of this, totally worth looking into. Super cool stuff. Um, uh, are you aware of GNU Radio? Uh, no. Okay. I can imagine. So GNU Radio is this software Thought framework. You could <laughs> <laughs> nice. I like it. 
<laughs> is this software framework for defining um, RF frontends on software defined radios? So like low pass filtering, encoding, decoding, um, like uh, channel selectors, all that kind of stuff. Yeah. And the USRP is like the hardware front end for that. So it's like basically just a really nice ADC hooked up to a wire as an antenna. Sweet. Um, and uh, uh, depending on what you do um, with your like GME radio front end, or front end for it, um, you can like turn it into a cell tower, you can turn it into That's awesome. um, like uh, a satellite radio receiver, kind of anything you want. It's like super cool stuff. That's really cool. Um, but I was, uh, I was hanging out at a hacker space once where somebody was working with a, a USRP and they turned it into a cell tower and got everybody at the hacker space's phones to connect to it. Uh, and then it like didn't go anywhere. Like it wasn't actually connected to, to So it just network. was basically a glorified um, jammer. Yeah, basically. <laughs> Except like the phone looked like it was fine. Like it was connected to a tower. It had full bars. Uh, everybody there was furious. <laughs> I used to sell cell jammers when I was an undergrad. Really? It's super illegal. I probably shouldn't yeah. be saying this on the air. <laughs> As per the Federal Communications Act of 1934, the cell waves are considered the property of the company that's licensed to operate on them. That's yeah, what this is. I mean, that'd be uh, some valuable hardware for Ukraine right now. <laughs> <laughs> is it is Russia using cell phone communication for the military? Yeah, there was some interesting thing recently about how Russia, they bombed some cell towers but they were using cell phones at the time. What? So they were like cutting. It's they like cut the right their own hand communication. Yeah, the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing there. It's Jesus like Christ. ridiculous. Um, Why are they using cell phones for like, I don't know. The war zone. Jeez. Oh, I mean, they are super convenient. That's true. Like, imagine if you didn't have a cell phone. Like, I, we live in Pittsburgh. Every, every time I think I know like how to drive in Pittsburgh, I'm like, I'll go to a new place. I get lost 17 times going there. Like, any place that's new. Actually, I got a funny story about that from a buddy at the Army. Um, so they were in a convoy, and I think the U.S. Army, as far as I know, still has this procedure of just printing out map quest directions for wherever they were going. I see it. Yeah. I see it. Because if you lose cell network, like, you're screwed. You don't know where you're going. Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. But somebody that was leading this convoy had made a wrong turn. <laughs> oh, no. And so, oh, no. like, there was this lady that was, like, you know, specialist so-and-so, whose name I won't say, you know, like, he's like, I, I believe we're going the wrong way. And they're like, well, how do you know that? He's like, because I have this technology that we all have in our pockets. <laughs> I'm on Google Maps right now. <laughs> yeah, okay. It's good to have confirmation from a third source, yeah. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> a whole car, like an armored convoy. It's just oh, man. relying on map quest directions going the wrong way. That's a little embarrassing. Yeah, for sure. Uh, his his words to me were, if there was a paid version of map quest, they would use it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> just because. Okay. <laughs> Top you up, bro. Oh, thank you. Yeah, no problem. So drinking uh, Glen Morgani scotch, just because normally we do... Uh, bourbon and I felt like doing scotch today. It's a good scotch. It's decent. Yeah, I really like it. It's not too pricey either. I think it was like under 50 bucks for the bottle. So. Oh, nice. Yeah. I have, so I'm like, I like a good scotch. I like a good uh, drink in general, but I'm like not picky and I definitely don't have like high, high class taste. Yeah. But I have friends who are like really into scotch. That's um, awesome. And have like 50, 100 different scotches. That's awesome. And they've like offered to take me on a tour of Scotland where it's like, yeah, it's a tour of Scotland, but you don't leave the living room. You just like, <laughs> you, you just drink. And it's like, this this is from this place. This is from that place. And honestly, that's fun, but it's kind of wasted on me. Yeah, it makes um, sense. Because I get too wasted. But yeah, well, I mean, I'll, my thing is like, I want to drink like a good one for the first drink. And then after that, it's a total waste of money. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> And like I don't know, I've been I've been digging like the like not super expensive. I mean I think it's just the volume I drink, which is not nothing. Like I like I don't know, I like a good like thirty to sixty dollar bottle of something. Sure. It's like not not super and you can still get pretty good stuff. Yeah, so. I mean that's true. Yeah. I have kids now, so I don't drink a lot. Um I think 
I think it's been a long time since I've had more than uh, more than two drinks in a night. But like, I do like a good cocktail. So I've been I've been working on my uh, uh, my Manhattans lately. And getting nice. Good at that. What do you use for vermouth? Um, I mean, this is this is Pittsburgh, so I just go to the like wine and spirit store. And get <laughs> the only vermouth they have. That's a good um, point. I really like uh, Antica Formula. Okay, I'll have to look at that. I, I want to say it's like it's not bad. It's maybe like a fifty dollar bottle. Okay. But um, I have one here if you want to try Manhattan at some point. Yeah, I'll have to look at that. Yeah, for sure. But um, I, I can go off camera and get ice cubes and cherries and vermouth. I can convert <laughs> these. Maybe. Yeah, fuck it. Uh, All I, right. This, I usually I usually don't do this, but. Let's, uh... <laughs> All right, I'm gonna take this opportunity to pee. Sounds good. I think I am also going to do the same thing. Apparently, the uh, director of hardware, Harry Spurs, commented on the Olympic Haha, well done. Oh, this drink mixing has become a team effort. <laughs> right. I like your straw there. It's very Thank nice. You. I figured uh, that way I could like taste to see if yours had the right ratio. Without, um, so yeah, so that's probably a good amount of. Uh, we're we're about equal, I think, right? Yeah. Separate but equal. All right. And then <laughs> one. And speaking of politically incorrect, sorry. <laughs> Yeah, uh, probably cut that, Carl. Take take that out. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm assuming the last five minutes are going to be taken out. Like honestly, it was a shame though, because I feel like the little montage of mixing these. God damn it! <laughs> it's kind of fun. That's think, good. Does it want more vermouth? You think? It's good. It's very good. And then these cherries are definitely my fave. Mm. 
tres. Luxardo. Yeah, they're pretty good. They're pricey as all. I think it's like 15 or 30 bucks for a jar of them. Wow. When you consider how quickly you go through it versus the other stuff, I'm sure it's like probably the best bargain out of all of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Man. All right, and we're back with Manhattans. <laughs> Cheers. Very good Manhattans. Thank you, sir. You're welcome, sir. Yeah. So that's going to want to be edited, noting the time. <laughs> we both spend like an abnormal amount of time in the bathroom and crack politically insensitive jokes. All right. Yeah, you'll just have to imagine it. It was yeah. amazing. Yeah, exactly. Uh, at one point, there was a little gunplay. Um, yeah, that was pretty good. <laughs> All right. All right, so what were we on about before we went into a tour of Scotland, making Manhattans? You like cocktails. This is the one you've been focused on. That's how we went down this town here. I think I think that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Any other cocktails that you like to make at home? Um, I don't. I don't think so. Um, my my in laws have an amazing margarita recipe. Nice. But I haven't mastered that one yet. So. Dude, that's, it all, it all takes nice just on. time and and like you said. Yeah. The the problem is like. You know, I, I only have like a couple of cocktails a week, so it doesn't give me a lot of opportunities to practice. I need to make drinks for more people. Yeah, dude, well, I'll volunteer if you All right. If, it's up to you, but I feel like a little more vermouth might not be the worst right. thing in the world. All right. All right. Definitely easier to, uh, to add it than take it away. Better or worse? good okay a little sweeter it's good sorry if I, if I overdid it it's about right yeah probably probably didn't need it I might have, I might have gone too far like I said I'm not too picky as a person like I think there's a very wide range in which a drink can be good uh, which I don't know if that uh, says something about me and my taste but I don't know I'm easy to please probably a good thing right yeah I enjoy life. I'll put it that way. I think that's the way to be. I mean, it's it's much better, I think, to be content than to be constantly discontent, which I feel like <laughs> is unfortunately close to where I am. I think some people enjoy their discontentitude, though. Yeah. Like, there, there's definitely a certain kind of um, joy that people sometimes take in... Uh, Anticipating the next best thing that's better than what they've got. I was going to say being... Um, giving a good critique of the thing that they're appreciating right now. Oh, like, that's a good point. This has all of these problems, and I am just like, every single issue that I come up with is a way for me to interact with it as a thing. Yeah, that's a good point. Did you ever that's see History of the World Part 1, like the Mel Brooks movie? No, I didn't. So there's this scene where they're going through like the history of the world, and they show a... Um, basically like a, it's like a caveman bit okay. uh, this came out in the 70s uh, it was like very um not politically correct enough. not politically correct but also like feels like they were probably doing a lot of cocaine when they made it like it just sure. i would imagine you know sure. like not my thing but it just it, stri it speaks to that era right and okay. so like um basically um there's a scene where they're like you know, the first marriage, and it just shows somebody knocking someone else out with a club and, like, dragging them off. Okay. And then it's, like, the first homosexual marriage. It's just, like, a man knocking another man out with a club and then dragging them off. And then it's, like, the first artist, and it's a guy drawing, like, a stick figure on, on the wall of a cave. And then it goes, the first critic, and it's just a guy walking up to the other guy's drawing and peeing on it. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. That was amazing. Yeah. <laughs> well, I won't pee in your drink, so congratulations. Thank you. Yeah, I appreciate that. That's like the nicest thing anyone's done for me all day. <laughs> Man, I'm sorry about the rest of your day. Honestly, <laughs> honestly. Yeah, I'm joking. It's a fine day. <laughs> yeah, I spent all day coding, so I had a good day. Nice. Yeah. Yeah, I um, I I had some interesting things go on that I can't talk about. <laughs> one day. Yeah, one day. I have been spending a lot of time lately trying to 
get better at programming in like a um, computer science sense. Like, I went to school for electrical engineering, so for a long time, I was able to hold my own in programming. I could like make everything work, but it wasn't pretty. It wasn't clean. And I've been spending a lot of time over the past six months, maybe, like trying to become the CS style programmer. Oh, that's like, awesome! Having all the algorithms experience. Have you like, had like coworkers helping you out with that? Yeah. Badass. Yeah. Um, actually, like my current place has this really nice thing where they have like readership reviews, where they do style reviews of whatever code you're writing. That's awesome. Yeah. So that's it's a really good way to to actually like learn how to do things. Not just that work, but that are efficient and maintainable. Clean for the next person. Yeah. Yeah, that's yeah. awesome. Although, I have some bad habits to unlearn, so I've been like working on that. Well, it's cool that you're getting the feedback to know what to work on. Um, for sure. Like, I'm a big fan of that kind of professional development. and. Yeah. I think, so I've worked with a lot of people who are um, older than me. They have like 10 or 20 years more experience than me, who um, at an application level, like, oh, I need to solve this specific problem, are very, very good, and they can, like, solve those problems. But at a, like, maintainable code level, like, I won't say they don't care, but they spent their entire career um, not worrying about maintainability and just sense. solving the, like, next problem in front of them. Apparently people with PhDs code like that a lot. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I think that, like, if, if you're in the software industry, you, you kind of, like, learn how to write maintainable code. Yeah. And if you're not, you just, like, that's not a thing that ever comes up. Um, and so especially in the embedded world, there's a lot of code that does what it does very well. But if anybody comes on to the <laughs> team who hasn't used it before, they spend six months figuring out what's going on. That's hilarious. Yeah, I've worked with teams that have made code like that where it's... Um... I remember one engineer saying to of another one, he's going to have to decipher his own hieroglyphics on this one. Oh, yeah. That's very common. Very yeah. common. Like, a year from now, I look at something. I know I wrote this. I can see, like, this is this is my style. I, like, look and get, and it's like, yes, I was the one who committed this. I have no idea what's going on. I've been there, too, actually. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm trying to be better. I'll look back on, like, accomplishments, too, and just be like, how did I achieve that? Like, I'm such a yeah. piece of garbage. How did I get yeah. that done? <laughs> Obviously, whoever did this was amazing. Yeah. Apparently, I was the one who did it, but I don't. I have no. It's like I just this. blacked out yeah. and did something awesome, and then yeah, yeah I was like, oh shit, I guess that was me. <laughs> don't know how I would accomplish that again today, but <laughs> I did yeah. it. Yeah. Turns yeah. out when you're like under the gun and have to get something done. That's it. I think that's it. Yeah. And then a lot of it's just like you just laser focus in, and your memory turns off, and just the parts of you that need to be. Or yeah, cranking. at some level of sleep deprivation, like you just don't form new memories, but you still keep getting. I think that's done. it. I, I think that's totally it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I stay up for three days and like something comes out that actually works. There, there's a lot of epic stories of people like staying up for three days, developing something amazing, and then like going off and collapsing. I've never done that. Uh, I have poured pulled more old double all nighters than. Like, I, I pulled one all-nighter in my entire life, and after pulling that all-nighter to finish the, like, this was in college, I, like, pulled this all-nighter to finish some, uh, a homework assignment that was, like, the final project. Um, <laughs> af after we got it finished, I, like, passed out and slept through the class where I was supposed to deliver it. Ah, oh, dude, brutal. Yeah, it was harsh, it was harsh. Luckily, my teammates delivered it for me and, like, gave my apologies and everything, but I passed <laughs> the class. Um... I don't do well on, on lack of sleep, so. Yeah, I, I do okay, but not great. Like, I probably shouldn't do it as much. I think it's a little bit of a vice at this. Like, I think I'm, I'm like, I shouldn't be doing it at this point in my career or my life, but I'm a little bit like a POW that, like, still sleeps under the bed because it's what they're used to, and there's, like, a weird dysfunctional comfort syndrome. in it. Yeah, I think, I think that's it. Yeah. So I think, like, even though, like, I don't really have to do that anymore and it's not actually serving a benefit, I'm kind of broken. And so, like, I'll yeah. there, there's feel a lot like I need of, to. Uh, there's a lot of research that shows that, like, people are not good at noticing how much sleep deprivation is impacting them. 
So like people will say, oh yeah, I haven't slept in a day and a half, but I'm still delivering good software. And actually, they're, it's just garbage. They're just making things worse. Just gibberish. Um, yeah. I've definitely been there. I've also been in the place where it's been like, I've been programming for 12 hours and I have to keep going to deliver this thing and I like get it done. So there's a trade off there. But for sure. And there's like, definitely, there's a fatigue point you pass, yeah. I think. But. You, at the point where you're like introducing more bugs than you're fixing, you should stop. But that's also the point where it's like... Well, I've also been in a management role with teams where like they definitely weren't getting enough sleep, but we were really under the gun and you're just printing money. <laughs> Hopefully. Hopefully you're printing money. Yeah, I mean, you know, you're just trying to accomplish something. And, and, you know, the client is happy that you're doing it and your deadline's ridiculous. And I, I remember one person in particular that I had on, on a high-stress project like that where I'm like, oh, my God, you're a machine. And the person goes, I am not a machine. I need to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, I am going to burn out, you know. And I'm like, oh, fuck, I'm it's a horrible person. It's not called sleeping. It's called recharging. We just... <laughs> plug you in uh, <laughs> yeah. 12 hours but I meant it as a compliment but I realized like I was I was I don't want to say destroying this person but like it wasn't healthy for them and so yeah I mean they they paid off a lot of things throughout that project like I don't feel totally bad there and you know I mean we still work together there, there's a really interesting thing that I've noticed which is um to a like to a large extent people will work you as hard as you're willing to work and you have to kind of push back to like gain work-life balance or control over your own time. That's interesting. Um, Tell me more. But if, if you do push back, people are generally like very receptive to it. Um, I, I uh, had one manager, he, the way he put it was like, I'm not your mom. Like you, like you set your own hours, like you're, you're salaried, you're not hourly. I, I'm not like looking at how long you work for, get your stuff done. And, um, at that point, I was like very, uh, I'll say seeking approval. Yeah, maybe. I've been there too. Um, so it was like, hey, can I been take this too. time I'm off? Or like, there, but, I, I, yeah. need, I need to like work really hard to get this, this thing done. But like actually what I've learned is like if I set my own boundaries, he's totally fine to, uh, to respect those and like say, yeah, you need, you need your time off. You're, you're like saying you need like – you can't work 10 hour days or 12 hour days or 14 hour days. Yeah. And for me, the thing that I had to learn to do was say like, no, I'm done now. And if I didn't say that, uh, this particular manager would be like, cool, keep working. And if I did say that, he'd be like, cool. Okay. Go home and do your thing. And I really had to be the one to like drive that's that. interesting like, he wasn't my mom like I yeah. was the one who had to say what I needed and like set my own boundaries and everything but as soon as I did it was fine um, that's cool and like being able to notice that and do that was a skill that I did not learn in, in school yeah well I mean rotate like you want to incentivize people to work those kind of pushes but there is kind yeah. of diminishing returns so yeah when you're working like a high stress project, I feel like there's there's a fatigue that's constantly there. And sorry, I didn't mean to like negate no, no, no. your point, but I've been in a position where like I've had to like con like you rotate people out, like you work them to exhaustion, you pay them very well for it, sure, and then you know you move on to the next one, and you like you know that like this person needs seventy two hours of rest before they can work like that again, and then you get them the fuck back in there. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think so. so there's, there's there's a project management question too, right? Yeah. Like, I worked in a lot of places where I ended up working sixty hour weeks at the very end to finish things off, and it didn't need to be that way. Like things were just disorganized. There was no timeline. It was like suddenly, from on high, it was said, "Hey, you have to like fly out and demo this project to the customer next week." And I'm like, "What?" Why didn't you tell me this three months ago? That this yeah, was gonna I've been in that position and, too. Uh, I, I think that, like, from a project brother. management yeah. perspective, if things are going well, you never have to work somebody that hard. Yeah. But um, like, well, a lot of it was like SKA got called in as firefighters. Oh yeah. Like, so that, this was your job was to like solve those problems. Right? Yeah. So we would go in to like a project where there was supposed to be eighteen months of timeline and solve it in two and a half. Yeah. And so, <laughs> okay. it, it was by nature. You're not going to sleep then. Yeah. Yeah. But you pay everybody above market. You know, you offer bonuses. Um, you know, you just, you do everything you can to make it worth everyone's while. 
and then it's it's kind of consensual, you know, abuse in a way. Sure. <laughs> sure. Sounds bad. It's, it's not, not abuse. It's it's consensual. Like, they yeah. want it. They want it. Well, I mean, everybody is everybody is paying things off, you know, and it's. I like it too. Like it's it's very exciting to, you know, push yourself past your limit and then reap a very large reward. You know, there is so. something that's really amazing about putting in a lot of hours, making something that is like actually technically like very excellent and well done. And then seeing it, delivering it to a customer and seeing it work. And, and then knowing that it's still really out nice. there working. Really nice. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. I will say my preference is to like work normal hours and like make Well, and I think I'm starting to get there myself, yeah. to be honest. Um, I vacillate. I mean, I, I, I get this mania where like I want to work insane hours. Um, which is fun, and I feel like a lot of my best work is accomplished that way. There's yeah. kind of a heroic aspect to that. Like, yeah, I'm doing something like that's hard and amazing. Like, yeah. there, there's a good narrative to it. Yeah. But you just being like a jerk by like pumping yourself up to be this amazing person when really you're just torturing yourself and your coworkers. I don't know. Or, I mean, but you're still delivering products, so maybe. I don't know. I can see either side. Yeah. I think the. It does feel good to come in and save the day. Like, yeah. Like, you know. So, like, we both worked, like, normal employee jobs and also run contracting businesses. Yeah. In the contracting world, it's kind of like... You That's have what you're like expected a, to do. Uh, yeah. You, you, you have, like, kind of a closed, like, this is your deliverable. It's very well defined. Like, you, you talk to your customer. You know what you have to do. You, like, put in all the hours to get it done in time. Yeah, whatever it takes. Right. Like, and in the employee world, it's like, I'm going to show up. I'm going to do my job. It's somebody else's job to make sure that my job is, like, connecting with customer end goals. Well, I mean, unless you're, like, a product manager. Yeah, I guess I've never been a product manager aside, aside from, like, when I was consulting. So um, it's a little bit different. But there, there's very much a, a different mindset. Or a technical and program manager. I, I will say, working as an employee, I realized the value of, like, good program management where when I was a contractor I didn't need to have that value because I would just like work like extreme hours to get it done yeah. and I was an employee I'm like can you organize it well so I don't have to do that <laughs> <laughs> there is a beauty to that right I mean like I mean there's that rookie mistake of going like you know like you just kind of dilly dally until shit gets serious and then you work way too hard yeah yeah um and I feel like, you know, experience, like this day I, I tend to work in really, really hard and then chilling out toward the end of a project if things are going well. Um, I'm sure there's a balance where you can get that closer to a flat line, but I haven't. I, personally, I don't like flat lines. Like if, if everything is like a, the constant level of push, I start to feel just like bored. Yeah, same. Um, I do like the intensity. I just don't want it to be extreme. Like, I don't want to be eight, uh, 80 hours, or even really 60 hours, but if I'm at, like, 50 hours 50, for a week, and then, pretty chill. Uh, and then, like, the next week, I'm a little bit less, um, and then the week after that, I'm more, like... Um, That's kind of fun. I mean, having that focus and that emphasis, that can be really nice. Yeah. Um, well, I really do like the mania. Like, it sounds really bad, but I really, really like... I can see that in you. I can see that in you. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Like, I don't know, just when, when stuff's on fire, like, I start to feel calm. It's weird. Like, I have, I have anxiety. Like, I have, I have a pretty real amount of anxiety in my day-to-day -day life, but I never have it in a crisis. Like, mm -hmm. I, I think when, like, like, I don't know, the other day I was at work, and, like, the um, power for the whole office went out, and I just got up from my desk and ran toward the factory where all the breakers were and just started interfacing with electricians and trying to figure out what was wrong and how to fix it and how to make sure it didn't okay. happen again. Okay. And I was 100% calm at that moment in time. But then, like, I'll be on a date and I'll be just nervous and losing it. <laughs> like, well, that's high stakes, right? Yeah. <laughs> sure. I don't know. I don't know what it is about me, but, like, it's like it's maybe just trauma, broken. I don't know. I don't know. Stoic. Stoic. Definitely not stoic. That's the opposite of stoic. But uh, yeah. it's... Uh, uh, I'm, not, I'm not a fan of stoicism in general. I kind of so, like it, but... No, man. Like... What, what does stoicism mean to you? 
So, so, so Marcus, Marcus Aurelius, Aurelius, right? Yeah. He's, he's like the like Stoic. Right? right, yeah, he's got meditation, Bo- he's not my yeah. 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 Uh, Here's the thing about Marcus Aurelius. He was like the last good emperor of Rome. Like, he presided over the fall of Rome, basically. Um, <laughs> Brutal. Like, things continue to get worse after him. So he's in this place where he's like, yeah, things seem to be getting worse. How am I going to deal with that? I guess I'll just accept it. Um, I would not like to be like living through the fall of Rome. You That's know? interesting. Like, I, I would like to be pushing against that. Um, yeah. but it, it seemed like he, he still was an effective leader and was like... And yeah, and he was, a, he was a fantastic emperor from everything that I read. And, like, I'm not a historian, I don't know. But like yeah. everything that I read, he was a fantastic emperor. But the emperor is after him, not so much. Yeah. Well, like, if bit... he didn't lead, if, if, if he didn't like organize things that um, could continue after him, like that seems like a problem to me. Yeah, I see what you're saying. Uh, there were some good bits in meditations. Like there was one, like you know, like I don't want to get out of bed. This bed is so comfy. Animals don't do this. I should get out of bed. <laughs> like, animals totally do that. Yeah, they totally do. My cat is like all about being in bed. Yeah, for sure. And like, but like I um. I remember there was another one where he's like, should I be offended because this man has a smelly armpit? And he's like, all the, all, all the people he's going to have to deal with that day. That's he's amazing. like, this guy's armpit yeah. smell. This person's naggered. You yeah. know, this yeah. person. I, I'm, I'm, not probably... saying, I'm not saying that, like, there's nothing to stoicism. I think there's, uh, there's a lot of really valuable stuff. But the idea that you should be stoic towards everything in your life, uh, I can't, I can't, I just can't. Understand. Maybe, I don't know, maybe stoics learn, like, pragmatic, like, sure. looking for, you know, a positive light and yeah, what could sure. otherwise be, and I'm not always good at that, I mean, you know me, I can get bummed out as well as everyone else, but I try to, like, be like, how can I turn this into something good? Like, yeah. I don't know. There, there's, uh, what is that? Uh, I'm gonna forget it. There's the Scottish poet. Um, or maybe English poet who um, wrote this amazing poem that is like the exact opposite of stoicism. That's like rage against the dying of the light, like rage, <laughs> rage against the dying of the light. And I, I think about that rage a lot. Against the machine. Um, <laughs> kind of, yeah. Um, it's, it's like his whole his whole deal is like, you know, th- things might be collapsing. You might have literally no chance of like turning the tide. But you should still try. It's still like valuable to oh, like, do do what you can to like make things better, right? Um, yeah. And, well, my my one partner calls it like adding your grain of sand. Like, yeah. yeah. Um, which is like the opposite of stoicism. It's like stoicism is like accept things, like accept things as they are, which is valuable. Yeah, but at the same, totally buy that. No, you don't. What, well, what's your definition? For me, at least, it's like keep a calm head and act pragmatically like, yeah I don't know. no that makes sense um keeping a calm head acting pragmatically i can get behind that. well it's, it's like but the I... ulysses s grant thing where there was like an explosion and like a train and like rather than like panicking or ducking he ran toward the explosion to see how he could help you mm-hmm. know and yeah you know like lend support so like i don't know i mean that's kind of more what i'm referring to but maybe maybe i'm conflating stoves interesting with I, like I guess that doesn't intuitively seem like stoicism to me. Yeah, like, I, I'm, I'm not, not a good, historian. I'm, I'm not, not, I'm not, not a philosopher, expert, so. right? So I don't, I don't know. Yeah. I'm just, I, I'm, I'm giving my best understanding. We both yeah. know who Marcus Aurelius <laughs> is, so I mean, that sure. means there's sure. some commonality to our definition. But I mean, I, I could be wrong, right? I, I guess like the one thing that I think is really valuable and important, regardless of what stoicism means to you or to me. Is I've definitely it, heard it used the other way, right? Or like stoically flushing money down the toilet, yeah, and things like that. Yeah, I if you know something is good, it's worth working towards it, even if you know you can't achieve it. Um, uh, like, like it's it's the grain of sand thing, right? Okay. Like incrementally improving things, but then you're still, still achieving good. something, then, right? Like you're still. Like, it's not. I mean, in the grand scheme of things, none of it matters because we're all gonna sure. turn to dust sure. and. You know, or, I mean, or think about Marcus Aurelius, right? Yeah. Like, if he had pushed harder, could he have, like, slowed the fall of Rome? Like, maybe by a year. Who knows? But even that year is still, like, a, a huge impact to the people who experience it. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, I don't know. I feel like a lot of people use stoicism as, like, an excuse to, like, be disengaged or not doing things. 
and that bothers me. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I definitely try to be engaged, right? So, like, I mean, particularly in my work, like that's where I'm like, that's where I have the best advantage. Yeah. That's the thing yeah. I'm good at. Um, maybe I'm more disengaged than I should be in some parts of day to day life. Disengaging is easy. It's, it's yeah. a good defense mechanism, right? For it's sure. a good way to say like, this doesn't affect me. Um, whereas, like, if if it does like, affect I have you, something less you have to, of an like, advantage to impact this yeah. than I do, you know, to impact yeah. the reliability of this robotic system. Yeah. <laughs> like, it it can be like super overwhelming to say like, no, this sucks. I don't I don't like this. I want it to be different. I want to like push back against it and like rage against the dying of the light. Here's what I can do about it. I think right would be my my approach like, right. And can maybe, I make a difference? Yes. Okay, let's do it. Can yeah. I not make a difference? Okay, let me focus my attention elsewhere. Yeah. Which, I, that, that's a good way to see. That's way to, a, a good mindset, I think. Thanks. Uh, try, trying my best to be a decent human, but obviously don't have yeah. all the answers. Yeah. <laughs> I, I remember one time I was at a professional event, and um, this one person I bumped into was like, you know, so how was your day? And I was like, ah, you know, I was up all night working on things. And they were like, why did you do that? And I was like, well, it needed to be done. You know, I had a client relying on me and I just wanted to make sure that we achieved the objective. And uh, also people were relying on me to be here. So, you know, I decided to come here afterward instead of sleeping. And then they go like, you know, well, but really, why did you do that? And I go, because I'm fucking broken. <laughs> I, I don't think there's anything broken about wanting to uphold your um, your promises, right? I just didn't want to be in that conversation anymore. Sure, <laughs> so sure. Just, like whatever ends this talk the fastest yeah. is what I will say. Stop! Stop criticizing me. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, I, and I, I and I will say that I'm broken in order to keep you from criticizing me, even though I don't really believe that to be the case. Yeah, I, I mean, I feel like uh, it's very easy to say. Oh, I'm broken as as a way to be like I acknowledge that this thing is like socially like uncommon. Yeah, correct. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, it's it's interesting too, because like you, you mentioned the hero feeling like, you know, and I definitely felt that way, you know, doing all this work for, for clients and you know, just pushing to, to get all this stuff done and Totally. I, I've been in situations with like a full time job where I didn't need to do that, but I still stayed up on weekends to like work on other stuff because I just felt so addicted to the habit. Mm, yeah. So, I don't know. I worked, so I, I worked for Amazon for maybe a year, uh, maybe a little more. What would they year. like to work for, by the way? I mean, if you can talk about it. Normal. Okay. Um, Cause they, I know they have a reputation for like overworking folks. I did not experience that. That's good. Not at all. Um, actually like when that, so there was this really popular article that came out in the New York Times about how like people were crying at their desks and stuff. Um, oh, jeez. And when this article came out, I did not work for Amazon. This was before I worked for Amazon. <laughs> but I had a lot of friends who worked for Amazon, and 100% of them were like, that's bananas. Like, I'm just like at work making fun of this article, like telling my coworkers, oh, I'm going to go cry at my desk while I work on this problem. <laughs> um, that's pretty funny. It, like, I don't know. Uh, what What were you doing there? Like, can you say what? Like, what I was I was on the team that does their like uh, chow, checkout list store. Oh, cool. Um, yeah, it was, actually, it was very cool stuff. It's funny you should mention that because I had a client at SKA who um, was working on a checkout list store um, with certain types of radio technology, and then Amazon Go came around and just buried them. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Amazon Go does a lot of really cool stuff. Yeah. Um, and I had a point. What was my point to bringing this up? Crying at your desk. People think that's a farcical, and so they. No, before that. Lot. Before that. Um, okay, you're working at Amazon. Before you worked there, you read this article. Before that, I might. I might have lost it. It'll come back. Yeah, it'll. We'll, it'll we'll, we'll bring it back around. Um. I really no, like my hands. These me. are delicious. This is going to bother me. I, I had a point. Always, always. I wanted to bring it up for some reason. Whatever. All good. <laughs> yeah. I'll be stoic about it. I'll accept it. <laughs> That's all you can do, really. I mean. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, um, do you have any personal projects outside of Donkey Car that you're looking to get into? That's a good question. Um, I just finished uh, looking into um, Loam. So Loam, Loam is this algorithm to do simultaneous localization and mapping, SLAM, using only LiDAR. Oh, interesting. Um, yeah, so I, they, they have, there's like this paper that came out maybe six or seven years LiDAR ago. LiDAR only and mapping? Yeah. yeah okay, yeah. cool, yeah. Um, and the idea is like you have a LiDAR. You have no IMU or? No IMU. That's interesting. You can use an IMU to supplement, and that'll make things a lot better. Okay. But like assume you only have an IMU, how are you going to like move through some some region and know how you're moving and also map the space as you move. You can't map it with just an IMU. I mean, you would need... Yeah. Well, with a, with a LiDAR, you can. If, if all you have is a LiDAR, you can actually map it. You can, like, figure out how you're moving with just the LiDAR. Um, and it's pretty similar to what we were talking about with the donkey car, actually, where, you, like, you get a LiDAR frame, like, 360 degrees of LiDAR right. points. Sounds very similar. Yeah. Then, like, later you get another 360 degrees of LiDAR points. You find those key points, the, the feature points. You figure out how your robot moves between those two frames. And then you can say, like, what your ego motion is. And once you have your ego motion, you can use that as, like, a, a basically a seed to figure out how to add the LiDAR points that you've collected to your map. Is ego right motion place. the motion between frames? Or what is that? Ego motion is kind of, like... You know, ego is like you, you, your your person. How are you moving? So ego motion is like, how are you moving? How is your robot moving? Yeah, um, which and, is normally what your IMU or your yes. like, odometry would give you. Exactly. And, and so like part of this LOM algorithm um, is LiDAR odometry. Like the LO in LOM is LiDAR odometry. Okay, so how not do LiDAR do... only, LiDAR odometry. <laughs> exactly. How, how do you, if you don't have a IMU, do odometry with LiDAR? Um, and it's really cool, actually. You you do a lot of like um, uh, nearest neighbor analysis oh, with cool. uh, with your lidar points, where you say like, okay, I have two lidar frames that were taken like I don't know half a second apart. Um, how do you correlate the points in one frame to the points in another frame to figure out like what the motion must have been? And um, it's like a very iterative algorithm, yeah. which, which is interesting to me. It would um, have to be to work the way you're talking about. Yeah, reading this paper was really interesting because it made me realize how much of SLAM, how much of like simultaneous localization and mapping is kind of just like repeated guess and check. Um, like the entire algorithm is, okay, assume that you just moved in a straight line, then what would that mean? Now correct that. Now move, assume you moved in a slightly different uh, straight line, what would that mean? Now take that and correct what you said. Interesting. And, and just like iteratively slightly improve on your solution. It almost reminds me of like Dijkstra's algorithm a little bit, or Dijkstra's, depending yeah, on who you learned it from. I can see that. I can see that. Um, yeah, it, it's, it's very like nearest neighbor search. Yeah. Um, where you're, you're trying to say like what points in your new frame correspond to what points in your old frame. And um, it, assuming you can match those points accurately, you can come up with a vector of like how your robot moved between those frames. And once you have that vector, you can use that in order to inform where your new points should be inserted in your map. So you can say like, hey, I got this key point. This is like the corner of some Now that I know somewhere. my ego motion, I can ascertain yeah. or I can infer where that is relative to that, which means I can do Exactly, more. exactly, yeah. yeah. So like for every, for every frame, you get your ego motion. And then you take the points in that frame. And, and the ego motion is a position differential between that and the last frame, usually? Yeah. Okay, got it. But if you know your ego motion between each frame, you can get your ego motion over time. So you can say, like, at time zero, I'm here. Now, like, 30 minutes later, I'm taking this frame. But because I have my ego motion for, uh, from frame to frame for the last 30 minutes, I can say these points should be positioned he like in a specific place relative to my starting position um and then and then that's like the the mapping stage and to be honest like that's the part that was kind of most tricky for me to understand with simultaneous localization and mapping is that a map is like 
just a collection of LiDAR points. Um, you know, I'm, I'm used to looking at like Google Maps where it's all semantic meaning. Like there's, there's a label to this. Like this city is like Pittsburgh or this city is Milwaukee or whatever. Um, and like this road is like I-376 or whatever. Got it. Um, in slam maps, it's not at all like that. It's just like, is there something here or is there nothing there? And yeah. like the, the, there's no meaning to it basically. I, with that multi real sense thing, I did this awesome map of like my living room. <laughs> so, oh yeah, cool. Yeah, it was pretty sweet. So you just like moved the, the real sense around? So you know the real sense T265 tracking camera? I don't, is it it's just like two fisheye lenses and okay. it just has an integrated slam? Okay. It's sweet. So you mount one of those coplanar to like a D435 and you can do like a visual slam. Well, it's, it's, I think it's a point cloud slam, but then it also incorporates like colors. Sweet. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's pretty I mean, awesome. if, if you have like a, a stereo camera, you can get point cloud from that. Um, yeah. you're, you're like inferring the depth by comparing the two, like two dimensional images. Yeah. And that's gotta be what it's doing. So. Yeah. Yeah. Binocular vision is pretty sweet. Like there's, there's some cool, um, signal processing. When like I found out recently, processing. like pretty much all the military robots use binocular vision instead of LIDAR because LIDAR lights you up. And exposes oh, your position. Oh yeah, interesting, yeah. interesting. So I thought that was—I thought it was interesting too. Yeah. Although, uh, so different lidars use different frequencies of laser light, and I wonder if you could choose a, a frequency that's like uncommon, and oh, then you could just do lidar without like worrying about your enemy noticing. But I think it's an arms race, right? Or like at some point. That's a fair point. Yeah. People yeah, are yeah. gonna catch on, and they're gonna figure out a way. Yeah. So, it, so you only want to do passive. That makes sense. Yeah. Passive, and then the other big requirement seems to be able to operate in GPS to nine environments. Oh Just yeah, the for idea. sure. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, yeah, you've seen that too. Yeah, I mean, in the in the uh, space industry where I have spent a lot of time, like GPS denied is like the thing. Like everybody wants to be GPS denied, and part of that is like if you go to Mars or if you go to like. Um, one of the Jupiter moons. We're not going to just like build a GPS for that. I guess it would take a while. We are building GPS for the moon. Um, nice. There, there's like the the Luna net that pe that NASA wants to build, which is like a, a network of satellites around the moon. That doesn't that's sound that bad to do, honestly, with modern technology. Like, yeah, I mean, it's, it's expensive in launch terms. That makes it, sense. In terms of the satellite cost, it's not expensive, but in terms of the like launch terms, it's very expensive. Yeah. So, like, doing it to the moon makes sense if we're going to send people there. Doing it to Mars is going to make sense when we send people there, but doesn't make sense now. Yeah. Could you bring those satellites on, like, rockets that have people on them anyway and just, like, drop them on the way there? Like, I wonder if that would work. Yeah, it seems likely. Like, with, uh, like, SpaceX, like, Starship, whatever. There's, like, totally. there's so much payload on that thing. Totally. Yeah. 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 That would be cool. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. But for, like, exploration robots, um, like, if you if you send a robot to Titan, there's no GPS there. You have to operate in a GPS denied environment. That makes sense. Um, and, like, especially also, like, a lot of missiles assume that GPS is going to be jammed. So yeah, they have sense. to do, like, vision only or, uh, or like, inertial or, or whatever. Or both. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. I mean, I would, I would jam GPS if I thought someone was trying to shoot a missile at me. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, which I guess is why the first thing that gets missiled is the GPS jammers. <laughs> Maybe. Interesting. I mean, I think that was like the thing with the Iraq war, right? It's like we bombed all the communications and... and I would believe it. Jamming stuff I, first. Yeah, I, I guess I don't know know too much about that. What, yeah. what was the story there? Well, I, I don't know a lot about it either, but my understanding was that like one of the first targets was like just comms and... Yeah. I Which explains that the Russian Shannon thing we talked earlier. about earlier, where they were bombing all the cell towers. Yeah. It's just they didn't realize they were using those cell towers. <laughs> they were That's pretty hilarious. Yeah. yeah. You can just buy a satellite phone. Do people still use satellite phones? They must. Yeah, 100%. Like Iridium? Iridium's still a thing. Yeah. Um, satellite phones are probably going to be more and more popular over time with Starlink. Yeah, I would believe that. Well, I guess Starlink it would be hard to use with a satellite phone with because their receivers are pretty big. But like, um, what is it, OneWeb? I don't know if OneWeb supports satellite phones, but I wouldn't be surprised. That's interesting. Yeah, it makes sense. How big are the Starlink receivers? They're like pizza box sized. Oh yeah, that's um, not. There's not actually some super cool teardowns of Starlink receivers on YouTube. Like, nice. if you get a chance, definitely check that out because 
there's some amazing signal processing that goes on in Starlink receivers. That's interesting. Like, they're all these enormous phased ray antennas. Wait, really? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I guess that make to follow the fucking satellites. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Like, the, the Starlink receivers are, like, cutting edge, like, the most interesting uh, radio antenna uh, technology you could look at right now. Phased arrays are cool. Like, yeah. I'm a big fan. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. I mean, you've definitely seen the Delphi, like, electronically steered radar. I've seen a lot of ex electronically steered radar. I don't know if I've seen Delphi specifically. We were using that? it at Joy Mining. It's just a brand that makes okay. it, but okay. it's just an electronically yeah. steered radar module. It was designed to go in the bumper of a car, but we were using them on like large scale mining vehicles. Cool. I mean, yeah. that's kind of the same, right? Like yeah, more or less. I mean, just because it penetrates plastic doesn't mean you have to mount it behind plastic. Yeah. Huh. I'm gonna have to look into that. Yeah. That's, Delphi yeah. radar. Yeah, and they call okay. it ESR for electronically steered radar. Sweet, I'll look it up. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. And I um, definitely am excited to see what happens with solid state lidar. Um, I don't know if you've heard any developments oh, yeah. there recently, but I mean, to be honest, I haven't. Uh, what people are doing with flash lidar is super sweet, though. What's flash lidar? So most of the LIDARs that you can get, like Velodyne, for example, yeah, um, it's a bunch of LIDARs where there's like um, physically a thing spinning around. Like there's, yep. there's a motor. Yep. That's on every single Velodyne unit yeah. that I know of. Um, flash LIDAR, instead of like having a bunch of separate lasers that spin, it's like it flashes out a laser pulse and has a bunch of detectors. A laser so pulse or a light pulse? Mm, that's a good question. I guess I can't. Because laser is directional, right? Yes. So I don't um, think it's but also, like, most of the flash lighters that I know of are used in, like, space applications. Interesting. Where your range is so high that even a laser has enough dispersion that you can get some interesting responses from that's it. That's really interesting. Okay. Um, but that said, uh, this is maybe something that I should look up. Like, how, how do flash lighter work? But, like, a, a flash lighter is to a Velodyne as like global shutter is to a, a normal camera right what's global shutter um so like your cell phone camera for example has this cmos sensor in it that is uh what's called rolling shutter where what that means is there's like a single line of the cmos sensor that gets exposed at a time yeah and so it's like this um here's a line of like the right side of your face and here's the line right next to it and here's the line right next to it and rasterizing yeah it, it, it rasters uh the image um which works super well unless you're moving really fast in which case um you're going to be totally distorted because yeah, like a the, picasso yeah <laughs> uh the the like um uh, your your position at the end of the image is different than your position at the beginning of the image because you're rastering across it um, whereas global shutter exposes every pixel at the same time. Oh, badass. Um, which means that there's much less motion distortion. So, like, if you're looking at, like, a, um, a what camera you... for a robot, you okay. really want global shutter because global shutter lets you get really good... Um, uh, satellites uh, probably use global shutter for that reason. I don't know. That's a good question. You'd think with the speed that they're moving. But yeah. Maybe not. No, that, that makes sense to me. That makes yeah. sense to me. Um... Yeah. I know that I've gotten some horrible pictures of my cat because she moves while, like, the slow shutter on the thing. Totally. Yeah. Totally. Um, and, and, and so, like, global shutter versus rolling shutter has a huge impact on, um, like, image quality and whether or not you can use the sensor for, like, your robotics application. But at the same time, global, global shutter is very expensive. Rolling shutter is in every cell phone. It's very cheap. Global shutter, super expensive. Like... I guess I don't know numbers, but like no, I wouldn't be surprised about 10x, uh, 10x the cost, or even more, right? Because um, you're exposing every pixel at once. And so flash LiDAR is the same idea okay, of yeah, LiDAR. Yeah, you're exposing like every laser at once, you're not like spinning and doing a, a scan over time. Giant laser beam or flash, and then just a bunch of sensors. Exactly, exactly, yeah. No, it's cool. Yeah. And, and so, like, having that, like, flash LiDAR or uh, a global sensor camera, global shutter camera, like, that 
hugely reduces the distortion of your sensor. And have you been following off. Velodyne's stock at all? Sorry, I don't mean no, that. No, I haven't. I haven't. Apparently, it's, like, it was doing pretty poorly last I checked. I haven't looked recently. But it's weird to me, because I bought a bunch of shares, and then as a roboticist, I'm like, everybody uses Velodyne, they're great. But apparently, David Hall got in a fight with his board. Huh, I haven't heard that. So, yeah, it was, it was interesting. My, so what I heard about Velodyne is that way, way back, like, 15 years ago during the Dartford Grand Challenge, um, this David Hall guy, like, shows up at the Dartford Grand Challenge and talks to all of the contestants and says, like, what do you need? That's awesome. And they basically describe a LiDAR to him as we, like, in the modern day will understand it. Yeah. And you're like, okay, I can make that. And the next year he comes back and he sells them to every single team. <laughs> and, like, that's how he became the LiDAR. Like, that's how Velodyne became the LiDAR. The LiDAR king, yeah. Like, Velodyne used to be a speaker company, I think. Um, uh, yeah, that's what I heard, too. Uh, and then he, like, totally pivoted after the DARPA Grand Challenge to do this thing to deliver to robotics companies. But now, in 2022, everybody knows what LiDAR is. Everybody knows how to build one. And they don't have, like, a competitive advantage anymore. That makes a lot of sense. Um, and there's, there's an additional thing, which is, like, a lot of people are looking into ways to improve on LiDAR spatial resolution, temporal resolution, speed, um, uh, latency. Like, how, how do you make a better LiDAR? There's, like, probably 20 or 30 startups to make better LiDAR. And, okay. And um, I would not be surprised if that's impacting Valentine's stock. That makes a lot of sense, too. That said, Velodyne's pretty nice. Like I like their lighters a lot. Yeah. I've had good experiences. Prefer Velodyne to Quantergy. I haven't used Quantergy. They're kind of noisy, but... Okay. Yeah. Uh, there, there are a lot of really interesting problems that show up if you're trying to make a lighter. I've heard good things about Ouster, but I haven't tried them yet. I, uh, I worked with a company that used Ouster, and they, yeah. like... I didn't work directly with the lighter, but it seemed to work pretty well. Nice. Yeah, yeah and the price is right. I mean, yeah. Like 3K for the OS1 or something. Hmm. Yeah, that's a lot better than a lot of other things. Yeah, yeah. Although on eBay for a while, I'm sure it's weird now with global supply chain, you could get the Velodyne VLP16s for like 3K, but used. You know? Yeah. 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 But if you want like a. 32 or a 64 laser lidar. Oh, you're gonna spend that. some coin. Yeah. Well, and you you are gonna want that if you have like a really demanding robotics application, right? Yeah. Um, like especially if you have like real time demands on like interacting with humans. Like humans are just like horrible to interact with. You don't want to interact with a human if you're a robot. Um, and if you do have to interact with a human, you want all the sensors at the like highest spatial and temporal resolution you can get. Interrupt because you don't want to miss the human. Yeah, yeah, and like people are kind of unpredictable. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's pretty funny. Okay, so like, um, I've heard this debate between lidar and cameras for self driving cars. Do you have a horse in the race or an opinion on it all? Well, it's really hard to say. Um, I'll say I don't personally have a strong opinion, but there's there's kind of the two camps, right? There's Elon Musk, yep. and there's literally everybody else. <laughs> <laughs> That's it, yeah, 100%. Uh, Elon Musk is like, people drive cars, people have stereo vision, we don't need LiDAR. Everybody else is like, LiDAR makes things easier, let's use it. Yeah. Um, so... I'm in the camp that like LiDAR makes things easier. I can see why he wouldn't want to put it in because it's like expensive and um, then you have like an additional sensor modality you have to deal with and like additional complexity. Uh, every well, additional... I would think tuning in those cameras is way more money than getting LiDAR to go, like you said. Cameras are solid state. They don't move. So if you put a camera in there, all you have to do is make sure the lens is clean and you're done. If you put a lighter on something, suddenly, like, you know, it's spinning at whatever rate it's spinning at. You have to make sure that, like, it's able to continue spinning. It also has its own window, its lens that you have to clean. So it's, like, strictly more complicated and more error-prone than, than cameras. Oh, interesting. Um, that said, 
people use them because, like, for a reason. They they give you a lot of really valuable information. What you could make that lens like self cleaning. I mean, you could run nitrogen over the lens surface. Oh yeah, there's, there's a lot of stuff you could do to yeah. clean the lens automatically. Like a human doesn't have to clean it, but yeah. somebody has to clean it. Yeah. Um, I've seen Bosch cameras with wipers on them. Totally, totally. Yeah. And because it's spinning, like whatever cleaning mechanism you have. Like has to deal with the fact that the lens is spinning, right? Yeah. Whereas a camera is like probably static. Um, it, oh, that's interesting. Have you seen those Rotoclear cameras? I haven't. What are those? So that's a camera where the lens spins in this direction at like six thousand RPMs, I believe, and the oh. centrifugal force keeps um, like liquids off the camera. That's kind of cool. Yeah. That's kind of cool. And then I think they also run positive pressure behind it in addition to. Okay. Roto clear cameras. I yeah, have to look that one up. Looking up. That's awesome. Yeah. You're welcome. Yeah. I guess on on the like lidar versus camera only debate for for self driving cars, I'm like whatever works, whatever lets you like build something that works. Yeah, um, for sure. Which uh, seems like the lidar is strictly winning. <laughs> <laughs> like. Uh, I, I've, I've never ridden in a Tesla in full self-driving mode, but from YouTube, it seems like, like they're not great. Yeah, I almost crashed into a roundabout. Yikes. Whereas, like, uh, what is it, Waymo? Um, Waymo has, like, permission from San Francisco to drive with no safety driver now. Wait, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is, this is just recently announced. Um, so, like, they're, they're in San Francisco. They're driving with... Um, they, they can, like, pick up people in San Francisco paying customers um, and like drive fully self-driving. Wait, is Waymo running like an Uber now? Like just to be able to test the so. cars? Okay, that's so. cool. Yeah. I did not know that. Yeah. And they have like a ton of Their sensor is really weird. It's like that orb that you see on top of those things or are they doing something different now? I don't know. Uh, last time I saw them, so they have a lot of LiDARs actually. Like they have, yeah. they have this like LiDAR on the back, they have a LiDAR on the top. Um, yeah. They have letters in the front. Um, it's like all over the place. Yeah, yeah, fair enough. But it's all pretty custom. Like they're making their own, I think, as far as I think so. Yeah. yeah. I think right now a lot of uh, self driving companies are making their own sensors. That's interesting. Well, I think they all have different ideas about the right way to do it. Um, I wouldn't be surprised 20 years from now if, there's, if it's all come out of me like. Somebody well, like, it was for a while with, with Velodyne, I mean, yeah. we talked about, and yeah. I feel like it's gone the other way, and yeah. then maybe it'll go back. One of the interesting things, actually, this, this, this touches with what you were saying about the military and LiDAR, yeah. um, about it being, like, detectable. Uh, if you have a thousand self-driving cars on the road, they're going to start interfering with each other with LiDAR, because they're all spitting out LiDAR um, lasers at the same frequency. Like, if the That's lasers hit each other... Then suddenly you're like you're jammed. Exactly. Whereas if it's purely passive, purely cameras, you don't have to worry about that. That's interesting. I hadn't thought about that. And I don't think that's going to be a huge issue, but it's definitely something to think about. I mean, it definitely could be an issue. I mean, there were when I was in grad school, there were a lot of research problems about like collaborative self-driving cars and the idea that you can communicate, you know, like how you're going to park to other cars and... Oh, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Going. Man, DSRC, um, I think that's what it's called. There, for a long time, the government was super into this thing called DSRC, which is like this network between vehicles so they can communicate like driving intent and like parking intent and everything. And I don't know how much of it is a pipe dream, but if it like works out the way people want it to, it would be so much better than what we have now. Interesting. Because you can communicate with like stoplights, and so stoplights can be suddenly. Well, it's much almost more like reactive. you have an air traffic control instead of just being totally. a free for all. Totally. Yeah. Yeah, and and like stoplights right now are kind of like air traffic control, but they're not as responsive as you might want them to be. Like everybody's had the experience. Mm. It's like ten or eleven at night. They're at a stoplight. There's nobody coming the other way, but it's still a red light. <laughs> yep. Right? Like, that kind of thing, except, like, multiplied by a 1,000 or multiplied by, like, however many stoplights there are in a city. If, if everything is networked and you know the intent behind all vehicles, then you can really optimize traffic much more. Interesting. Um, so, so that's very exciting. Um, and if, like, you have self-driving cars that are all connected to this, 
then maybe you don't even need stoplights. Like everybody just like uh, actively negotiates their driving path and like you never have to stop. Um, which would be terrifying to be in a car that's doing that, but also yeah. very Or cool. can you imagine being in a non-self-driving car while that's on the road? <laughs> yeah. I guess in that future, all the cars are self-driving. Yeah. I, I feel like at some point, self-driving cars will be good enough that it will be uh, more dangerous to drive yourself. And For sure. Like, uh, oh, man. There was this one thing that I was reading, like some sci-fi sometime, about some guy who, like, uh, got the death penalty for getting in a, a collision um, oh, when, he was, when he was driving. And the reason is that he had to hack his car so that he could drive himself because, like, everything was self-driving at that point. That's interesting. And um, if you were driving on your own, then you were, like, totally interfering with, uh, like, the highly algorithmic order of, like, traffic. That kind of makes sense. I mean, the death penalty is a bit extreme. What is this, Singapore? <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, yeah, at some point we'll be able to optimize things significantly, but uh, it'll, be, it'll be interesting to see the path that we take to get there. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, no, it's interesting. I mean, I think people are still going to want to drive, like, 70s muscle cars and stuff like that just because it's fun. That, that's a fair point, yeah. Yeah. yeah I don't know. But, I mean, I had fun driving that Tesla in autopilot mode until it almost crashed me into a roundabout. <laughs> yeah. yeah. I think they've, they've amended it to detect roundabouts since then. I, nobody told me it couldn't detect yeah. roundabouts. I really like driving as long as there's no other drivers around. And so, if they're... Like, I, I definitely think we will never reach a point at which nobody drives. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, I think we will reach a point at which like 90% of people don't drive for 90% of trips. I believe that. Well, there's probably also going to be a point at which like not having a self-driving car is a luxury or like a, a novelty. Yeah, yeah. That's, that's a good point. Like you're weird if you have <laughs> manual cars. And you might be right about like that sci-fi where like the penalties if you screw up with that manual car are very stiff. Yeah, because you, you be like actively away. made the decision to do this dangerous thing, not yeah. just like this was required by the limitations of your technology. And you're putting other people in danger by yeah. by driving. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Well, um, what else? Like, is there anything you want to talk about? Anything you want to plug? No, I think we talked about all the stuff that I'm thinking about lately, like uh, Slam, LiDAR, Loam, uh, Donkey Cars. That's donkey all the, Cars that's are all cool. That's all the cool stuff. Yeah. Sweet. Well, yeah. thanks for tuning in. If you got this far, please subscribe. And uh, yeah, you're the best. Yeah. Good thanks. spending an hour with you. Good spending an hour with you. All right. Let's see what we got. Oh, it's still recording.